welcome in the name of the Lord. We give thanks for the new month of November and the autumn breezes and winds and here rains <laughs> that have come upon us. We give thanks for your people, O Lord, scattered across the length and breadth of this land and others, and ask as we come together in your name, you strengthen us as we are looked down upon by that great cloud of witnesses, all the saints who watch us as they sing praises to God. We begin our worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and ask that we might receive forgiveness. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, <laughs> no one could stand. But with you there is forgiveness, and therefore you are to be feared and worshipped. Merciful God, the widow's might challenges us to examine our hearts and our habits. We are surrounded by others who need a listening and compassionate ear, who need us to take notice and to care. But we hurry by, so consumed with our own needs and affairs that we don't even see them. Forgive us for being stingy with our time, not being there to mentor or teach, make repairs, aid, assist, prepare food or acknowledge those in need. Forgive us for being selfish with our resources, Blessed with such material gifts and abundance, often our giving is characterized more by fear and scarcity than generosity. Forgive us for being tight-fisted with our hearts, not letting them be open to others, afraid that they might be stressed or even broken. Remind us of that widow, so full of devotion to you, she couldn't help but give all she had as a response to your great grace. Fellow sinners, God is a God of abundance and strength. He forgives us our sins, not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has done for us. By his death on the cross, he has washed us clean from our sin and made us whole, holy, and holy his. May God equip us in every good work to do his will, now and always. Amen. The Old Testament lesson is taken from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. The Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath near Sidon. There is a widow there who will feed you. I have given her my instructions. So Elijah went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, would you please bring me a cup of water? As she was going to get it, he called to her, and bring me a bite of bread, too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook, cook this as our last meal. Then my son and I will die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go ahead and cook that last meal, but bake me a little loaf of bread first. Afterward, there will still be enough food for you and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be plenty of flour and oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her son continued to eat from her supply of flour and oil for many days. No matter how much they used, there was always enough left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. The epistle lesson is taken from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 28. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once and for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it, and just as it is appointed for mortals to die once and after the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The gospel for this Sunday is taken from Mark chapter 12, verses 38 to 44. In it, Jesus talks about the gift of a widow that he observed in the temple. 
Mark records. As he taught, Jesus said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. Expect to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and, for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greatest condemnation. Jesus sat down opposite the collection box and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which were worth barely a penny. He called his disciples over and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who contributed to the treasury. For all of them contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she has to live on. Let us pray. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. And let these words be yours and bless. Amen. Jesus said, this widow gave out of her poverty everything she had, all she had to live on. You know, it's virtually impossible to be a part of a Missouri Synod congregation and not see a few of these lying around, mite boxes. The LWML, the Lutheran Women's Missionary League, has down through the years raised millions of dollars for mission causes, and this is the source. These tiny little boxes, crammed full with pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters, have made a huge impact for Christ in the world. But you know, I've got to tell you, even though it's a great idea, it completely misconstrues the point Jesus is trying to make. Mite boxes are filled with the extra coins we have lying around, our disposable income, the leftovers from our accumulated wealth that we usually don't even miss. But the widow's gift, however, the original mite was all that she had, everything. Meaning she had no idea how she was ever going to get by the next day. So I thought I'd make that little play on words and call that which her, give, her gift disposable outcome. Now we're more familiar with the other one, disposable income. That's the one we're familiar with. You look at the definition and it's the pittance that we have left after taxes, rent, food, clothes, insurance, and dog food. It's, it's how much we really have to spend on what we really want. And it's also something we don't feel we ever have enough of. And what we do have usually gets sucked into credit card debt, savings, investments, and that doesn't always leave a lot for the offering plate. More often, we tend to see charitable giving as one option among many to use with our disposable income, something we can give out of our abundance. If we can, once everything, the more important things are already taken care of, then we can do that our disposable income, basically our leftovers constitute these gifts. But you know, even when it's a substantial amount, even when it's a significant portion of what we have, even when it's a large chunk of change that can do a world of good, it's not the same. I commend people for such kind of giving. I deliberately don't know who you are, but I commend you for that. And yet I think I can safely say that not one of us has ever put in everything we have, all we've got to live on. We don't sacrifice our future that way. Disposable income, maybe, but disposing of our outcome, no. In the gospel lesson, I sometimes wonder what was going through that widow's mind. She goes up to the temple, the most beautiful, well-appointed, holiest place on earth, surrounded by the wealthy and affluent, priests and noblemen, the cultural despisers of people like her, and she marches right up to the offering horn with her donation to Lepta, the smallest, most pathetic coin minted. It was nothing. But it was everything she had. You ever wonder what her motivation was? 
Was she just naive? Yeah, I'm going to church. I have to put something in. Was she angry? Take this, you unresponsive God. Was she so desperate, hoping her little gift would reap dividends, like some people would spend their last $2 on a lottery ticket? Or was she resigned? Yeah. This isn't enough for me to live on. You might as well have it. We don't know what that was. But that doesn't really matter. What does matter is that Jesus knew. And he knew that she had put in everything she had. That's why he gathers his disciples, including us, around to take a good look at this woman. His point is not that we sh could give more. It's not that our giving should constitute a greater percentage of what we have. His point is to trust God. And that partial trust or calculated trust isn't really trust at all. Not the kind that is so evident in the biblical faithfulness examples. Like the widow of Zarephath in the Old Testament lesson today, who feeds the prophet, giving it up her last bits of flour and oil. Like Ruth, who follows her mother-in-law's instructions, even though they're a bit odd. Like Job in the midst of a perennial disaster, like Daniel in the lion's den, like Paul in Felix prison, like the Israelites wandering in the wilderness, like Christ himself on the cross. God seems to delight when his people put their absolute, complete trust in him. That no matter how bad things are, no matter how few options we feel we may have, no matter how bleak the future may seem to be, we remember three things. One, God is faithful. Two, God knows what tomorrow will bring. And three, God loves us. So the proper response is disposing of whatever constitutes our plans or self-initiated outcomes, our controlling our futures, giving it all up, whatever that it may be, entirely to God. This is so hard. Even though our money says, you know, in God we trust, we often tend to trust in the money more. And we tell ourselves it is foolish to live sacrificially. We have to leave something for a rainy day. That would be throwing away our future. But ironically, Jesus says it's the exact opposite. It's not throwing away our future. It's placing our future entirely in God's hands. He once told this story about a rich man who had a couple of really good harvests and wants to enjoy his golden years, live off his investments. And he says, just to eat, drink, and be merry. What does Jesus call him? A fool. I mean, how secure and enjoyable will wealth be once we're dead? There's an interesting word in our gospel lesson. Who stood I? It's lack or poverty. And it's only used twice in the entire New Testament. The widow gave out of her husterai, out of what she did not have. The only other place it's used is just earlier, two chapters earlier in Mark chapter 10, about a rich young ruler who Jesus says, you lack one thing, and tells him to sell all he has, give it to the poor, and then come and follow him. He doesn't. He can't. And he walks away with his stuff. He walks away from Jesus. That's the ultimate husterai, poverty. And when you think about it, it isn't surprising at all, is it? How often what we think we need only reveals what we lack. You don't see them as much on TV as you used to just a couple years ago, those Texas Hold'em's poker tournaments. I used to enjoy watching them, you know, especially when a player decides to go all in and slides his chips into the pot. It's a decision he makes on the basis of the cards, his intuition, the odds, or the tells of the other players around him. But the viewer knows what everybody else's cards are. He doesn't. That's... That's why they call it gambling. It's such a tense moment sitting there making that decision. 
But once that decision is made, it's almost like a relief. The player stands up, takes off his sunglasses, starts walking around saying something like, well, it's all up to... Now we, who give it all up to God, can answer that, finish that phrase with hope. Maybe not in cards, but in everything important. All in. That's what Jesus wants from us. Trust me. That's what he invites us to do. Give to me whatever it is you value most. If any want to be my followers, he said, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. But those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will gain it forever. Disposable outcome. Give out of your lack, and God promises you will lack nothing. But let's be honest here. There's trusting in God and there's trusting in God. And there's also putting the Lord your God to the test. Now, I'm not saying put every last bit of wealth you have in our collection bags and you'll get some reward. At least I don't want you to think that that's what I'm saying. Because we've got to point out that we don't actually know what happened to the widow that next day. Whether it was devastating having nothing. But what I would like to convey is this. Straight from the lips of Jesus, take a good look at that widow. Appreciate her faith. And ponder how your faith can be more like hers. Now what you give up, your offering to God, it might not be money at all. In fact, often it's harder to give up our plans, agendas, expectations, time, and freedom. Put that all at his disposal. But every now and then, and more often each day, trust enough to absolutely, totally, rashly give it all up to God. Place your future, your next day, your next moment entirely in His hands. Living and believing, giving and forgiving knowing that you can always trust in Him. Dispose of your outcome and just see what God gives you in return. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. In communion with all the saints of all time, let us lift up our prayers to God who knows what we need. We pray for the church that would always seek to welcome those disregarded or misunderstood by society at whole. We pray for the world that leaders of nations might be diligent in making policy that honors those who are poor and in need, that protects our planet from ourselves, that leads to peace and not war. We pray for all those whose spouses had died and whose income might be limited. May they be provided for by caring family, friends, and neighbors. Might we be willing and able and ready to offer assistance. We pray for those who are ill, especially those that weigh down in our hearts right now that we name before you. We pray that they would know God's love in the midst of their sickness and pain and that healing strength would be theirs. We pray for those who give their abundance of resources to this congregation, to missions, to all over the world, that they might be blessed in their giving and the mission of spreading the gospel might be advanced and extended. We pray and remember all the faithfully departed and those who mourn their absence even today. That the comfort of the Holy Spirit might keep them 
in tune and alive themselves with the resurrected hope of the kingdom to come. O oh God, your reign endures forever. And in Christ, we are free to be your saints and servants. Hear our prayer for the sake of him who died and rose again, and even now lives with you in the company of all the saints and angels in heaven. Hear these our prayers in his name. We pray. Amen. And now in the words that Christ has taught us, we're bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us for evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go forth from this place in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, giving glory to God with all your being. And may God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you. Amen. That's our worship for today. We thank you for watching and, and staying tuned. And we hope you stay healthy as well. Uh, hope someday we'll put this coronavirus behind us and worship together in strength, but it's going to be different. We, we give thanks for all the people that have supported our church and, and the churches around. A uh, reminder that next Sunday, November 14th at about 12.15, 12.30, um, we'll have our annual meeting, a budget, elections, uh, new business and challenges before our people. So hope you get a chance to be there um, in person and, and, and see what we're going on in the church. If you come by, take a look at it because Habitat for Humanity has started work on building a street and there's pipes and earth moving equipment and, and that sounds of good stuff going on. And of course, the floor is being put in. It's, it's, things are happening here. And so we, we give you thanks for being a part of it. As usual, offices are open. Feel free to give us a call, pop by, um, share, share stuff what's going on, and, and above all, um, share the love of Christ. That's how the saints have equipped us and how we can show God's love to the rest of the world. Be at peace.